In the summer of 2023, a spacecraft was stranded in orbit, not because of a technical issue, but because the FAA wouldn't allow it to land. And on board, it had critical medicine, ritonavir crystals, and I'm probably mispronouncing that, that were designed to be used for AIDS treatment. This spacecraft circled the Earth for eight months before finally overcoming its regulatory woes and setting down in the Utah desert. This was not going to work in the long run. If the FAA continued to be so obstructionist with this company, which is by the way called Varda, their mission of manufacturing medicine very important pharmaceuticals in orbit in a microgravity environment where these types of medications cannot be manufactured on Earth in a 1G environment, well, all of this mission would simply come to nothing. There had to be another solution, another part of the world where the FAA wielded less power and perhaps they wouldn't run afoul of so many regulatory pitfalls. So who came to the rescue? Which company, which country was responsible for making Varda's mission of manufacturing critical pharmaceuticals in orbit a possibility? Well, I had an opportunity to visit this company just a few days ago in Adelaide, Australia. I'm going to bring you the details of that interview, what they did to solve Varda's problems, and the other exciting things they're doing to spearhead Australia's entry into the world of commercial spaceflight. All of this and more coming at you on The Angry Astronaut right now. Good afternoon, folks. I have the fantastic opportunity of being here at Southern Launch in Adelaide in Australia. Many of you probably have never heard of this company or what they do, but I can't overemphasize the importance of what they're doing for space flight and especially space medicine. We're going to talk about that in a few minutes. First of all, let's get going here. Would you be so kind as to introduce yourself to the viewers? Hi, I'm uh, Amy Featherston, and I'm the General Manager of Sales and Marketing at Southern Launch. Once again, really appreciate your time. So first of all, let's talk about this room that we're in here. It's a mission control room, as I can see. Tell me, what sort of missions are you controlling here? Yes, yeah, so we operate two spaceports in South Australia. So this is our Adelaide mission control where we can coordinate missions at either spaceport. So on launch or return day, um, we will have a variety of staff in here doing all the rocket science-y things that they need to do, including wind waiting and predicting trajectories and all that really good stuff to make sure our missions are safe. So let's dive right into one of these missions. And maybe you can tell me a little bit about how this uh, facility was involved in it and also how you know people in the field were involved in it, how you made it all happen. But first of all, we're talking about Varda here. Let's talk about when Varda approached you. Varda has this problem in the U.S. The FAA won't let them bring their satellites back that has very important experimental drugs on board. What were you able to do and, and what did they have to say to you? Yeah, so Varda reached out um, about a year before we did our first return with them. They had W1 stuck on orbit and they just reached out to see what could be possible from Australia. Pleasingly, we were able to um, secure regulatory approvals for a series of returns. So we secured three returns straight off the bat with the Australian Space Agency. And then just a year later, after that first initial conversation, we welcomed W2 back to Earth at the Kinniba Test Range. So it was a world first, world's first commercial spacecraft to land at a commercial spaceport. So pretty proud of that achievement. So you've had two of these satellites come back now. Clearly, it seems that Varda, in spite of the fact that they're an American company, feel that doing business with you is easier. Um, and they just you know, give up on the FAA conflict. So, I mean, how is that? How is it that you made things so much easier for them? Because we're talented, obviously. Uh, yeah, so W3 landed just 10 weeks later. And I think a big um, part of this is Australia's location. So uh, we have minimal sea traffic, minimal air traffic. So securing that airspace approval is much easier for us here because there's fewer flights flying through there. Um, we also have really great relationships with the airlines. So it's a lot easier to negotiate that stakeholder management. 
Um, and then our regulator. So our um, legislation is quite new. Um, and within that, there's scope to work collaboratively with regulators to take them on the journey, to help each other understand what's possible, and then reinforce the safety of these missions through pretty rigorous um, flight safety assessments and then, and you know, establishing all the boundaries you need around a mission to make sure it's safe, but playing into our low population, big lots of land and low air traffic. So it's, a, it's kind of a nice trifecta there. So you've told me a little bit about this Kaniba, um, and I'm probably mispronouncing all of this, the test range that you have. And it's, I mean, it's utterly colossal. But tell me, how did you get it, first of all? What can you do there? I mean, tell me about your, your operations there. Yeah, so the Kaniba test range is, I'll use miles for your American audience, uh, 15,830 square miles. So um, pretty massive, bigger than the state of Maryland. So we don't actually own it. We work in collaboration and partnership with the Kaniba Community Aboriginal Corporation. So Kaniba is a town of about 120 people. Um, it's uh, entirely um, Indigenous and we have worked collaboratively with their board for more than eight years to establish this world-class spaceport. And it's bringing investment and global um, opportunities to this tiny town in the centre of South Australia. And it's something we're incredibly proud of here at Southern Launch is to work in partnership with one of um, the oldest civilizations in the world and doing cutting edge space missions. We just think it's the best partnership ever. So tell me about these returns. And when Varda brought these satellites back, Back. You were there for at least one of them. And so tell me a little bit more about that experience. Yeah, I think I'm going to make you quite jealous, Jordan. I was the first person on earth to see W2 once it landed. So I walked out um, with our Indigenous elder. So part of what we do is we have cultural monitors for every mission and she flew out in the helicopter with us to make sure that the capsule had landed in an okay spot and that us retrieving it was going to be um, respectful of cultural heritage. So uh, Auntie Wanda and I were the first two on earth to see it, which was incredible. But the night before I was standing in a farm paddock at 2am and we had a team from a local university doing some optical tracking and they saw it before we did with the naked eye and then suddenly a fireball ap appeared on the horizon as the satellite bus started to burn up in the atmosphere and then this capsule just shot over our heads and then the sonic boom happened and it was just this really eerie moment. You know it's coming and then it comes and then you're just like, wow, what did I just witness? So then to fly out the next day and see it all charred from, from its journey and, and bring it back to uh, the hangar that we have was pretty special. And I was telling you earlier, we started to call her Winnie and she became quite, I, I became quite attached to her and was sad to see her go back to LA. No doubt. So, I mean, tell me about future plans then with Varda. I mean, clearly they think that you're the way to go. So, I mean, what do we have going with Varda? How frequent are these missions going to be? Are they going to get any bigger? Yeah, so W3 landed just 10 weeks later after W2. W4 is on orbit, so we're um, eagerly awaiting that one to land back at the Kniba test range. That's using the Varda bus for the first ever time, um, which is incredibly exciting for them and hats off to them for investing in that. Um, we're expecting W5 to, to launch very soon as well and we're ready to welcome them all back to Earth. So um, it's it's exciting. It's a, it's a huge thing for Australia as a nation. We see ourselves as becoming a cornerstone for launch and return and these VADA missions are really paving the way for us to do that. That's really fantastic. Thank you for that. Um, let's talk really briefly um, about your other facility, Whaler's Way, and your plans for orbital flight. Um, who's Who are you working with there? What kind of facility do you have? How many pads? That sort of thing. Tell me a little bit more about that. Yeah, so we've been working for almost eight years again to get the Whaler's Way Orbital Launch Complex approved. So unlike America, where you need to get environmental approvals for every single activity, we just need to get an approval at the start. So it's been a long journey um, at both the state government level and federal government level to get those approvals. But late last year, we got them, which is incredibly exciting. And now we're moving into that detailed design phase. So initial approvals are for two launch pads. Um, we're hoping to begin construction on them um, next year. And it'll be really awesome to um, have the polar and sun synchronous orbit capabilities here in Australia and complement other launch sites around the world. 
Now tell me about, since we're talking about orbital launch, tell me about Australia's need um, for those that sort of service. Um, are there a lot of satellites manufactured here? And also, is there a potential to get business from, say, Malaysian companies or Indonesia, something along those lines? Yeah, so Adelaide, where you are right now, is um, home to Australia's space industry. There's a number of um, satellite companies right here doing amazing things. There's um, space machines, which are trying to trying to create. Um, I don't know what the what you guys would call them. You know, when your car breaks down and you need someone to come help you, well, they're creating satellites to go help satellites on orbit that break down. So they're right here in Adelaide doing that. Um, there's a, a number of others doing really cool um, satellite manufacturing. But most of our customers are coming globally. So uh, Australia only has one rocket manufacturer at the moment, which is Gilmore Space. They've got their launch site up in Queensland. So we're really looking at all those other nations that have space launch capability and they're looking for a launch site. So we know the US sites are at capacity. So we're kind of picking up that next level, looking for their permanent launch sites. Okay, so let's talk about one last topic here, um, a more sensitive topic, and that is, of course, what you've told me about your close relationship with the indigenous peoples in in these regions, regions that are very sensitive to, you know, to a lot of folks. I mean, we've had, we've experienced these kinds of clashes in the United States as well. And usually these clashes simply remain hostile and the issues are resolved in the courts and usually nobody's happy at the end of the process. Somehow you guys are avoiding all of that. Tell me, how is this happening? How do you work with the indigenous people in this region? And, and and get them on board, I guess. I think the the number one is we just see them as partners. So it, it's not that they're indigenous or anything like that. It's like, no, we want to work together to do this. How can we work together to do this? What are the benefits for you? What are the benefits for us? And, and how can we collaborate to do these incredible world first missions and bring investment and global opportunity to these kids that live in a small town and, and perhaps never see that. I'm from a small country town myself and I get super proud when I see these kids learn about space and it adds to the dream time stories that they've been brought up with themselves over thousands and thousands of years. And then there's these new stories that are coming in of capsules returning from space. So we don't see our partnership with Kiniba as something special per se that we've had to, you know, come up with this particular strategy. It's just natural for us to work in collaboration with the Kiniba community. And we're really seeing the benefits of that because it's a true partnership and that's what's allowing us to do these incredible missions. Well, I'll tell you something. I mean, of all the things we've discussed and, and everything I've learned about your company, which is 99% of it I've learned today. Sorry about that, but I, I guess I just came here to learn. Um, but in any event, I guess what I'd like to emphasize is that that sets an incredible example. And it's an example that I've kind of seen all over the world when it comes to these smaller spaceports, the willingness to work in conjunction with indigenous peoples and also to work in conjunction with the environment, to work with it rather than against it. I think it sets an extremely good example for the rest of the world, especially for my home country, the United States. Is there anything else you'd like to share with the viewers about your mission and what we should be looking forward to soon? Oh, so yeah, partnership is at the core of everything we do. We do that with our customers as well. I think I would encourage all your viewers to follow our journey. It's going to be incredibly exciting. Um, I mentioned before, before, before the back end of this year, we're expecting three missions. And that's a lot for a small team here in Adelaide. And we're only gonna grow bigger and bigger. And um, it's exciting. Like I come to work every day and it doesn't feel like a job. And I think everyone in this um, building would feel the same way. And we're incredibly proud of what we do. And we're excited to start showing that on a global stage. So thank you for stopping by and having a chat. My pleasure. Thank you so much for your time today. So in closing, I'd like to say that in the two weeks that I've been in Australia thus far, I've discovered something very intriguing about this country, in spite of the fact that it mirrors the United Kingdom in many ways when it comes to parliamentary democracy and socialized medicine and very tough gun laws. Australia does what is necessary to get 
regulatory hurdles out of the way. They have a can-do attitude that I have noticed over and over again when it comes to important missions like what Varda is trying to achieve with manufacturing critical medications in orbit. And this company has proven to be one of the most impressive that I've seen thus far in terms of their ability to get past regulatory problems, get past the bureaucracy, and get the job done while working side by side with indigenous peoples at the same time and including them in their mission and employing them as well. It is a remarkable example, I think, as I said before, for the rest of private space flight around the world. And I'm looking forward to seeing what these folks do next. And by the way, it was suggested during my visit that I might have an opportunity to cover the next Varda mission, the next re-entry over the Australian outback here in just a couple of months. I'll keep you up to date on that. No promises were made, but still, it might be possible, and I can't wait for that opportunity should it become available. So, until next time, thanks very much for watching, and stay angry about space. <laughs>